Hello, Mr. Walton again. We're going to start a new book. It's called I Am Malala. It's about a young girl who um, fought for the right of education for females. And it's I Am Malala, How One Girl Stood Up for Education and Changed the World. those children all over the world who have no access to education, to those teachers who bravely continue teaching, and to anyone who has fought for their basic human rights and education. Okay, first let's look and see where this all takes place. Now over in the Middle East, and in between Asia, I mean, <laughs> India and Afghanistan, and bordered with Iran, China, and Kashmir. Oh, Kashmir, that's interesting. India and Pakistan. I've been feeding about that, and she's where she's from is very close to Kashmir. If you see that, okay. Okay, prologue. When I close my eyes, I can see my bedroom. The bed is unmade, my fu fluffy blanket in a heap, because I've rushed out, of, out for school, late for an exam. My school schedule is open on my desk to a page dated 9 October 2012. And my school uniform, my white shawar, now I'm going to pronounce these not perfectly, so you have to please forgive me. My white shawar and blue kamiz is on a peg on the wall waiting for me. I can hear the neighborhood kids playing cricket in the alley behind our house. I can hear the hum of the bazaar not far away. And if I listen very closely, I can hear Safina my friend next door tapping on the wall we share so she can tell me a secret. Now it mentioned uh, the kids playing cricket. Um, Pakistan used to be part of India and India was ruled by England till after World War II and through a lot of different things that happened. India and Pakistan separated. But the reason they, they um, play cricket, and it's such a popular sport in Pakistan and in India, is because it was a, a sport that they play, that the British played. Okay. I smell rice cooking as my mother works in the kitchen. I hear my little brothers fighting over the remote, the TV switching between WWE Smackdown and cartoons. Soon, I'll hear my father's deep voice as he calls out my nickname. Johnny, he'll say, which is Persian for dear one. How is the school running today? He was asking how things were at Kushal School for Girls, which he founded, and I attended. But I always took the opportunity to answer the question literally. Ah, but I joke. The school is walking, not running. This, is, this was my way of telling him 
I thought things could be better. I left that beloved home in Pakistan one morning, planning to drive back under the covers or to dive back under the covers as soon as school let out and ended up a world away. Some people say it is too dangerous for me to go back there now, that I'll never be able to return. And so from time to time, I go there in my mind. But now another family lives in that house Another girl sleeps in that bedroom where I am thousands of miles away. I don't care much about the other things in my room, but I do worry about the school trophies on my bookcase. I even dream about them sometimes. There's a runner's up award for the first speaking contest I ever entered and more than 45 golden cups and medals for being first in my class in exams, debates, and competitions. To someone else, they might seem more trinkets made of plastic. To someone else, they may simply look like prizes for good grades. But to me, they are reminders of the life I loved and the girl I was. Before I left home that fateful day, when I open my eyes and I am in my new bedroom, it is in a sturdy brick house in a damp and chilly place called Birmingham, England. Here there is water running from every tap, hot or cold as you like. No need to carry cans of gas from the market to heat the water. Here, there are large rooms with shiny wood floors filled with large furniture and a large, large TV. There's hardly a sound in this calm, leafy suburb. No children laughing and yelling, no, no women downstairs chopping vegetables and gossiping with my mother. No men smoking cigarettes and debating politics. Sometimes though, even with these thick walls between us, I can hear someone in my family crying for home. But then, my father will burst through the front door, his voice booming. Johnny, he'll say, how was school today? Now there's no play on words. He's not asking about the school he runs and I attend. But there's a note of worry in his voice, as if he fears I won't be there to reply. Because it was not long ago that I was nearly killed simply because I was speaking out about my right to go to school. It was the most ordinary of days. I was 15 in grade 9, and I'd stayed up far too late that night before studying for an exam. I'd already heard the rooster crow at dawn, but had fallen back to sleep. I'd heard the morning call to prayer from the mosque nearby, but managed to hide under my quilt. And prepare and pretend not to hear my father come to wake me. Then my mother came and gently shook my shoulder. Wake up, Pisho, she said, calling me kitten in Pashto, the language of the Pashtun, the Pashtun people. It's 7.30 and you're late for school. I had an exam on Pakistani studies, so I said a quick prayer to God. If it is your will, may I please come in first, I whispered. Oh, and thank you for all my success so far. I gulped down a bit of fried egg and Chapati with my tea. My youngest brother, Atal, was in an especially cheeky mood that morning. He was complaining about all the attention I'd received for speaking out about girls getting the same education as boys. And my father teased him a little at the breakfast table. When Malala is prime minister someday, 
You can be your secretary, he said. Atal, the little clown in the family, pretended to be cross. No, he cried. She will be my secretary. All this banter nearly made me late, and I raced out the door, my half-eaten breakfast still on the table. I ran down, ran down the lane just in time to see the school bus crammed with other girls on their way to school. I jumped in that Tuesday morning and never looked back at my home. The ride to school was quick, just five minutes up the road and along the river. I arrived on time and exam day passed, as it always did. The chaos of Mingora City surrounded us with its honking horns and factory noises while we worked silently, bent over our papers in hushed concentration. By day's end, I was tired but happy. I knew I'd done well on my test. Let's stay on for the second trip, said Moniba, my best friend. That way, we can chat a little longer. We always like to stay on for the late pickup. For days, I had a strange gnawing feeling that something bad was going to happen. One night, I found myself wondering about death. What is being dead really like? I wanted to know. I was alone in my room, so I turned toward Mecca and asked God. What happens when you die, I said. How would it feel? If I died, I wanted to be able to tell people what it felt like. Malala, you silly girl, I said to myself then. You'd be dead, and you couldn't tell people what it was like. Before I went to bed, I asked God for one more thing. Can I die a little bit and come back so I can tell people about it? But the next day had dawned bright and sunny, and so had the next one, and the one after that. And now I knew I'd done well on my exam. Whatever cloud had been hanging over my head had begun to clear away. So Moniba and I did what we always did. We had a good gossip. What face cream was she using? Had one of the male teachers gone for a baldness cure? And now that the first exam was old, over, how difficult would the next one be? When our bus was called, we ran down the steps. As usual, Modiba and the other girls covered their heads and faces before we stepped outside or outside the gate and got into the waiting Dinah, the white truck that was our Kushal school bus. And as usual, our driver was ready with a magic trick to amuse us. That day, he made a pebble disappear. No matter how hard we tried, we couldn't figure out his secret. We piled inside 20 girls and two teachers crammed into the three rows of benches stretching down the length of the Dina. It was hot and sticky, and there were no windows, just a yellowed plastic sheet that flapped against the side as we bounced along Mingora's crowded rush hour streets. Haji Baba Road was a jumble of brightly colored, colored rickshaws, women in flowing robes, men on scooters, honking and zigzagging through the traffic. We passed a shopkeeper butchering chickens, a boy selling ice cream cones, a billboard for Dr. Himaya's Hair Transplant Institute. Moniba and I were deep in conversation. I had my friends, but she was the friend of my heart, the one with whom I shared everything. That day, when we were talking about who would get the highest marks this term, one of the other girls started a song and the rest of us joined in. Just after we passed a little giant snack factory and the bend in the road, 
normal, no more than three minutes from my house, the van slowed to a halt. It was oddly quiet outside. It's so calm today, I said to Moniba. Where are all the people? I don't remember anything after that. But here's a story that's been told to me. Two young men in white robes stepped in front of our truck. Is this the Kashul school bus? One of them asked. The driver laughs, laughed. The name of the school was printed in black letters on the side. The other young man jumped into the tailboard and leaned into the back where we were all sitting. Who is Malala? he asked. No one said a word, but a few girls looked in my direction. He raised his arm and pointed at me. Some of the girls screamed and I squeezed Moniba's hand. Who is Malala? I am Malala, and this is my story. <laughs>